nationalism that brought about the independence of the people in Asia. Every nation in Asia gained its independence through the philosophy of nationalism. Every nation on the African continent that has gotten its independence brought it about through the philosophy of nationalism. And it will take black nationalism that to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country where we have suffered colonialism for the past 400 years. America is just as much a colonial power as England ever was. America is just as much a colonial power as France ever was. In fact, America is more so a colonial power than they, because she's a hypocritical colonial power behind it. What is 20th, what, what do you call second class citizenship? Why, that's colonization. Second class citizenship is nothing but 20th century slavery. How are you going to tell me you're a second class citizen? They don't have second class citizenship in any other government on this earth. They just have slaves and people who are free. Well, this country is a hypocrite. They try and make you think they set you free by calling you a second class citizen. No, you're nothing but a 20th century slave.
Hi everybody, uh, my name is Eric DeLuca. Um, I uh, teach at RISD in the um, Experimental and Foundations um, Department. And we are sitting having a discussion today um, about a project called Pass Me Not. And we have two fabulous musicians with us who um, are going to introduce um, themselves. But before I turn the floor over, uh, this project is part of a, of a really interesting program hosted by the Granoff Center at Brown University called Remaking the Real. And I think that that, um, that title or that theme could really be a useful way of thinking about the conversation that we're going to be having um, that's being weaved into the performance um, that you'll hear and see. So be thinking about that, remaking the real. So Orlando, Leland, do you want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, yeah. I'm Orlando Hernandez. Um, I, um, I use he, him pronouns. I don't know if we're going to be using pronouns here, but um, if, uh, if that comes up and then I'm a tap dancer, a theater maker, make different kinds of uh, performance work, uh, do different kinds of writing, um, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Cool. I'm Leland Baker, a uh, saxophonist, um, performing artist, teaching artist, uh, originally from Providence, Rhode Island. And, um, and yeah, you'll be hearing me and Orlando a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, in the beginning, in the, in the tune that we just heard, um, I sort of, I was thinking about several things, but one of the things that I think is worth bringing up right now is, if you remember, Leland plays a very um, repetitive two-note thing, two note sound. Um, can, you, can you quickly sort of unpack the decision to, to do that thing in that, in that, I mean that was an improvisation, right? Or was like yeah, yeah, it was, it was. I mean it kind of developed through improvisation. Me and Orlando, you know, it's, we've been working together um, lately for the last, I don't know, few weeks, couple of months. Um, so a lot of what we do, we kind of just get together and just, as we say, vibe, just create 
improvise. So that kind of came, it was improvisation, but it kind of, it kind of came through, um, uh, through the, the few times we got together to prepare for this. Um, so yeah, I don't know, for me it was just about feeling it, just keeping it simple enough to where the overall, I guess, story comes through of, of what we're trying to uh, say with that piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it is very kind of, um, I'd like to say African influence, you know, the whole idea is to be, um, to be inspired, to recognize, to highlight, to um, celebrate and acknowledge the, uh, all that this, this continent in itself, you know, the many nations and the many people of this continent, what they have given to American culture, to, to this part of the world in general. The islands, um, you know, Orlando will talk for himself, but you know, he, he's Puerto Rican, you know, so in, in, the, in the West Indies, in the Caribbean, South America, North America, um, they're often a forgotten people. And so, musically speaking, I mean, they have given um, so much, that culture, African culture, Western African, Central African culture has given so much to, um, to the music, to the arts. So for me, I was kind of hearing the stuff I've been checking out um, in terms of that music, and it just, it just developed how it developed. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you also um, talked about that sound as representing the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. could, you, yeah. could you just quickly um, yeah. describe that sim symbolism? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, as the heartbeat, Orlando is, 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 is in that piece more active than me, per se, but uh, it's, uh, you know, the idea is to, to work together. Like, I, again, to the, I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of the overall, trying to get to the overall thing. And like, if I have to, whatever I have to do to make that happen, play simple, you know, I'll just keep the pulse moving, it's important, you know, that heartbeat. Um, it's about community really too, you know, um, because I'm thinking too, like when, during the Atlantic slave trade, when, when uh, Africans were captured and brought here as slaves, you know, they were brought here as, as a community. These, these were villages, these were families that were taken here, so that's all they had was each other. So I think it's important in everything they do, you know, it, it just pours out into their culture in itself, which comes through in the music, yeah. And part of that for me is like the, the time, like the time that we're sharing and creating together in a piece like that. Like it's like a, it's something that we're kind of negotiating as we go. It's like we, we find it and then we, then it gets a little jagged and goes over here and then we get misaligned for a second and then we find, find each other again. Um, and that, that kind of like multi-centered um, feeling is, is a kind of uh, a way of thinking about community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very raw and earthy and in the moment, honest, right? right? Very honest, you know. In yeah. <clears throat> no, including times that just like, you know, it's like my, my, that board is, is uh, starting to chip away up top. So, you know, if my foot gets caught, then, you know, my foot gets caught. It's right, something, right, right. <laughs> something that happens. It is what it is, right? So, so let's get some, let's get to some basics here. Um, just describe, you, you both have these instruments, these kind of appendages of your body in the case of Leland, which is the sax. And then I'm, when I was listening to that first performance, I was like, what is Orlando's instrument? Is his body an instrument? Mm -hmm. So can you just maybe briefly unpack? I, I mean, you know, tap dancing might be foreign to some people within a sort of musical performance, especially with a saxophone, but can you just introduce the in, your instrument um, to, to folks? Definitely, definitely. So tap dance is a, an African um, and African-American diasporic tradition. Um, it's, uh, it, it comes out of uh, that displacement that Lena was talking about. Um, black people in the US, um, transposing, finding, th connecting threads, uh, cultural expressions through rhythm, through embodied rhythm. Um, there was uh, an outlawing of the, um, the use of drums 
and enslaved people couldn't use their drums because that was threatening uh, to white slave owners. And, um, and tap dancing, the, the, um, the embodying, the embodiment right, of, uh, of some of those rhythms is part of the, the deep history of tap dance. Um, tap dance, as we think about it with tap shoes, um, is uh, a more recent thing. That would be kind of early 20th century. Taps were put on the shoes for amplification, for sound amplification. Um, and that's when some, uh, a, a kind of ongoing developing uh, vocabulary that, that um, came about in the 19th century of uh, steps and of uh, gestures um, through minstrel shows. So there's a, a deep history of racial and racist um, ways of seeing um, built into that um, s through vaudeville. And then really, um, together with jazz music, growing up in the early 20th century. Um, and so a lot of the vocabulary is coming from swing. Um, a lot of it is really coming from jazz music contexts. Um, and so that question of instrument is interesting because it does, I think, you know, there is a way that the, the shoes are, are an instrument. Um, there's a way that the floor is an instrument. There's a way that the body is an, inst is an instrument, I think. And, uh, and I think all of that together also, for me, is, is, it's like a different kind of agency, too. It's different than, like, I am a fully formed, like, I am a person, and this is something I'm using. It's like there's a different kind of relating going on. And then um, to express yourself within that, means that you're kind of, there's an intergenerational thing, there's an environmental thing, um, and that ends up being part of uh, the instrument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and zooming out, um, you know, when I, when I met you, Leland, you spoke in a class and, of mine, and, and you were talking about um, the genre jazz and and its its name and I, I'm thinking about this opening Malcolm X quote where he's talking about colonialism could you could you quickly talk about the history of the naming of jazz and how that might be connected to this sort of long history of colonialism and 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 really sort of colonialism that's wrapped up in the American project of, of, of slavery mm -hmm. and, and race. Right. Right. I know that this is a sort of a multifaceted question, but when you, when, you describe to, when you describe to me and my students that jazz, jazz isn't really the, the name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, I, you know, and I'm not the first one to say it. It's, it's I think most, who, who are uh, lovers of that art form, who are very well versed in that art form, whether they're musicians or, or avid listeners, they know the history of, of, of what America is, you know, mm -hmm. being a colonial power as, as um, you know, it, it kind of still is. It's a way of just keeping, you know, certain, it's a way of keeping truths hidden in certain groups still, you know, put in place. And so with jazz, I mean, it became a huge export. One of the, the biggest, you know, uh, American exports, you know, in terms of culture and art. So, you know, they don't want to represent that as black, you know, black music, what, if, which it is, you know, and not, and, and, and that, that's, it's not uh, exclusive. It's just calling it what it is. It's like, I heard, I think, I forgot who said this, but um, it's like, if you take classical, if you take some Bach, it's like, uh, yeah, you can play Bach music. But that's still Germanic classical music. You have to acknowledge that, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, black folks have not really been acknowledged. It's been a practice in American culture to not acknowledge, you know, um, black culture as being a necessary hindrance to the progression and development of this of this country. And um, and so you, you see that with jazz too, you know, the name. There's a lot of different stories about how the name came about, um, but. Nevertheless, it's not really what it is. It's, you know, a, a lot of, I don't know. I think Duke, Duke Ellington, the great Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, um, uh, Lee Morgan, a lot of people have said it. Uh, Miles Davis, that, you know, it's, it's, 
you could call it black classical music <laughs> or just black, you know, as Nicholas Payton says, B B A M, BAM, black American music, you know. Um, so I think that's important in, in acknowledging that because you see a lot of the parallels too, whether it's hip hop, whether we're listening to bebop, whether we're listening to um, uh, R and B, doo wop, rock and roll, early rock and roll, it, it, the blues. You hear and see it, it's different, but you can hear and see that same element, you know. And that is something of where it's coming from, you know, black culture, African uh, roots. So this project um, is really a conversation both in sound and listening as we experience um, through performance. But then there's this other conversation and dialogue that happens around the music and around the sounds. Um, and so we decided to make a, 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 a form here that embodies that weaving of, mm -hmm. of sound listening and contextual discussion. So without further ado, let's listen to some more music. Welcome back. Um, we have another person on set. <laughs> Kwaku, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, um, my name is Kwaku Kwejiragre. I'm a, uh, a second year PhD student in computer science at Brown, and also I, uh, I play the bass. I'm from outside of the Philadelphia area, from a little town called Schwanksville. I'm uh, happy to be here. <laughs> and and 
Uh, we were just talking earlier about where your parents from. Yeah, your both parents of my parents are from Ghana, from the beautiful country of Ghana in West Africa. So, um, sorry, we're going to be kind of doing the mass dance um, to stay safe. The title of this project is is called Pass Me Not, and it's also um, the the piece we just heard. Could you could you tell us about that piece? Yeah. Yes, I guess I'll say something. So that that's a uh, a very standard gospel tune, um, spiritual. And when me and Orlando were um, conversating and going back and forth about what to name this project, this concert, I felt like, you know, I felt like that piece spoke volumes because that's something we like to do. We did it in some performances in the past and it's just a beautiful tune. <clears throat> but thinking about this kind of putting this, all, this whole thing together and trying to like recognize and highlight and celebrate um, uh, black culture, um, that piece, you know, speaks volumes, I think. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it kind of brings into, into the place of like, you know, pass me not, like, you know, just I'm here, you know. It's, it's really kind of, the words itself is more or less kind of relationship with, with God, talking about pass me not, you know, gentle savior. But in a way too, just the phrase itself, pass me not, we exist, you know. Um, black culture is important. Uh, Africa and the histories of Africa and African peoples and the peoples of the African diaspora are important, you know. And so that's what I got from it. That was my, you know, we came to the table and kind of hashed it out. And it can have many meanings. So I'm sure many viewers and will draw and conjure up their own thoughts and, and meanings of what that is. But that's, that's where I was coming from. I don't know if Orlando wants yeah. to add or had any. Oh yeah, no, I'll just say, I mean, um, when, we, when we were playing, when we, when we were getting ready for a gig in August um, in Roger Williams Park, we were getting our set list together and we had, it was mostly jazz tunes and then some, some tunes that we had, uh, we had found improvising, uh, some zones. And then um, we were trying to kind of finish out the set and it like, we, we, we hadn't found the right thing yet, basically, to kind of, that would kind of tie the set together and then we thought on doing a gospel tune and Leland brought in, um, brought in that and that just kind of opened something up, I think, for us. Um, and then we ended up playing it twice in, in, that, um, in that concert, once at the beginning and once at the end. So that's kind of become a, um, a way in also to, to the project, I think. Mm -hmm. And to, to bring Kaweku into the conversation, can you just briefly tell us how you got into j jazz? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and one that uh, um, I feel like it's really easy to spend so much time with music and kind of forget what your first introductions to it were. But um, my dad really loves um, John Coltrane and Love Supreme is one of his favorite albums. And so I used to hear it on repeat all of the time. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> it's a nice thing to have on repeat growing up. Uh, of all the things. And so it was either a mix of, you know, we'd hear Ghanaian music, High Life in the House, or we'd hear Love Supreme, we listened to a lot of Miles. Um, and then um, there came a point where in third grade, you know, they were going around polling kids, like, what instrument do you want to play? Um, and I picked the cello, because both of my parents said, you know, you're too big to play the bass. And I said, well, everyone else plays the violin, and I don't even know what a viola is. So um, I picked the cello. Um, and then after a year doing that, I really, you know, was just listening to this music and I identified that um, it was a bass that was in, in a lot of these, in a lot of these songs which characterized jazz, um, this black American music. And so I said, hey, I want to do that. And so I put the cello down fourth grade, um, picked up the bass and then kind of uh, full steam ahead from there. <laughs> nice. And to, to pivot here to a, to a topic I think that we all, um, think a lot about. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to recite a quote. I'm not going to be very dramatic in this, <laughs> in this reciting, but uh, Ursula K. Le Guin said, listening is not a reaction. It's a connection. 
Listening is not a reaction, it's a connection. And I'm interested to, th to learn about how you have been thinking about listening in your sort of collaboration, um, Orlando and Leland. And also, like, you know, uh, um, in that last performance, it's like, you know, this might be edited out of the, the, the video, but there was a conversation about the listening that happened between Kuweku and Leland about where particular tune was going. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be nice to hear about um, all the different ways that you've been thinking about listening within this project, Pass Me Not, but also maybe we can get some, some specific examples that happened in um, that last tune that we heard. Hmm. Who wants to start? <laughs> yeah. Want to, uh, you, uh, you want to start? I mean, yeah, I don't, I, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, yes, listening is definitely, a, it's a connection, I would agree. And, and for me, in any kind of you know, context, I always try to actively listen, because um, it's about creating. It's about, it's about the overall picture and goal, right? I think Miles Davis, you know, beyond being a great musician, was such a great band leader because no matter how big he got, he always put the band, the music was first. Like there was no one, there was not a star in the band. You know, people could crown their own star, whoever was their favorite, but Miles knew like, I'm putting a, a band together because these guys know how to make music. They're there for the music, you know? And um, you know, that's the same thing I try to follow. So with this collaboration, I mean, yeah, I'm just, you know, we're feeding off each other. So I'm listening to what, uh, uh, and particularly this project is very unique. It's just saxophone and, 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 and tap dance, you know, dancing. So a lot of it is very rhythmic and I'm trying to draw from, use what I got as a melodic instrument, uh, but also draw from what Orlando's given me rhythmically in terms of phrasing and just trying to develop with him, you know? So it's, it's very important for me to listen on a deeper level, not just listening like, oh yeah, I hear that. Yeah. Most of us, everybody in this room can hear. We're all lucky to have our hearing. But um, it's about finding that connection. And that, and that calls for it. When that happens, you're deeply listening, you know? So you're saying that, so you're saying that, that listening as a connection is about attention and, and paying attention. Yes, yeah. And you, I totally agree. And I, and I also think that, that um, paying listening, what were you going to say? Sorry, yeah, paying, pay, not to cut you off, paying attention, but also trying, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but it's meditative in a way, because you are trying to fall into a place of where, you know, uh, of, of, of where this is taking you, you know, of, of what there is to be found, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I, what I was getting at, I mean, I, Orlando, you're hungry to talk. I, I think that I, I'm gonna, I'll kind of poetically sort of introduce what you wanna say. I'm, I'm maybe mind reading right now, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, during that first tune that we heard that opened this weaving of dialogue and performance, um, you know, I was in this space and I felt in my body um, the body of Orlando and the motion that he was creating on that wooden platform with his feet. So in a way, Orlando's body was creating sounds and vibrations in this space that was shaking and physically connecting my body. So I think, Leland, you're talking about listening as a, as a kind of metaphor for paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder also how listening becomes a connection f physically too and how 
listening is a very tactile act and process. Um, so Orlando, maybe you could, you could talk about this and what it means to be creating really kind of tactile sounds in the space using your feet and your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got, well, I got like, I got like six thoughts, so I'm gonna try and like <laughs> do a little. Um, just because I'm, 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 I'm sitting for a second with, uh, with, with, with Leland, what, what you just said about um, it also, it's like a sharing, it's so, what you're talking about, Eric, is a bit like a sharing space in a, in a very kind of vibrational way. And then also there's a sense of direction or a sense of, of movement towards something. And I think that's, for me, like that, yeah, that, that, that gets together with, um, with the past me not in some way. It's, it, there's something uh, theological about that, I think. Um, a sense of, of being with people towards something. Um, and, um, and one of the reasons we like to play in this, uh, in this space is because of the way it vibrates. Um, so I had a similar, uh, similar experience the other day based on where Leland was standing that I, was, I felt the vibration in a, in a different way than I had been. When he moved over, basically, the, the, the space started to, to kind of ring. Um, so the, so it's, it's, uh, it's sensitive to space and spaces. Um, so something that, as tap dancers, that we have to uh, think about a lot is the surfaces that we dance on um, to protect our bodies and also for, for sound. Um, and a lot of the time, places aren't kind of built for it. So it's like stages will have, you know, dance studios will have Marley over, over the floor. Stages will have different types of, uh, you know, just something straight on top of cement. Um, and a lot of the time, we're bringing our own floors. Or bringing, um, and it's not even because we, I mean, well, speaking for myself, like, I'm pretty open to different sounds and, and playing with different, um, I say that as I, as I hit, hit the microphone on my, um, play with different sounds, play with different spaces. Um, and so there's something about tuning into that. Um, and uh, it makes me think, uh, uh, something that jumped to mind around listening and, uh, and this kind of connection. Um, for me, it was like a few years ago, I um, got to spend some time in Puerto Rico, where my father's from, um, doing a residency over there and developing some work. And one of the things that ended up being really cool is that tap dance is not really found much over there. Um, I mean, people have images from the U.S. basically, but there's not really a culture of tap dance there. Um, even though there are a lot of Puerto Rican tap dancers actually in, in the U.S. Um, but, um, but over there, it was something that when I shared it with, with folks, there was a way that they could listen to it based on traditions that are there. So something like bomba and plena and these different like percussive um, improvised dance and music forms, there's a way that... that um, the context there provided a way of listening to what I was doing. And so I think that's another part of that, that connecting is that it's like contextual and um, opens up to, to a kind of multi-contextual um, listening, which is cool, which is, it's, it's, that, that's like, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in motion, that feels in motion.
So to round out this um, amazing performance, conversation, collaboration, we, I, wanted to, I wanted to really focus on a particular question, um, which I think relates to a lot of what we've been talking about um, in terms of the canon, how history is written, and, and the silences that are in the archive of our lives. Um, and it's a simple question that I think that um, is the focus of this festival that the Granoff Center is sort of organizing, which is what does it mean to remake the real? And how, how are you doing that in your, your artistic practice, but also in your, in your individual lives? And how, how has the remaking of the real and reality surfaced in your collaboration and also Koweku's um, collaboration in this particular performance? I can, I can take this one real quick. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question, this idea of like a remaking the real, because I think that, you know, before you answer the question, one of the first things to do is kind of define the real, um, you know, and not in like a overly metaphysical sense, but I definitely think that everyone comes perhaps with a different, you know, set of cognitive behaviors and a different kind of understanding of, uh, and relationship with the, how they ground their senses and experiences. And so um, I definitely think that when you you, you, you take everyone's individual understanding of what is and you kind of, you know, bring it to art, you can bring it to science, everyone's own personal practice. I think everyone has a different definition of remaking the real, um, which I think is something that's super beautiful. But at least for me, one of the, the, the things that I think about with regards to remaking the real is kind of the act of um, innovating and being present, present with art. I think that um, especially being um, someone who kind of is very much researching technology and invested in, um, in ideas of that nature, just our, our interactions with our, our own privacy, physical and digital, um, our interactions with our own attention, um, physical and digital, a lot of these things which are kind of, uh, our interaction with, with vision and eyesight, you know, a lot of these things are kind of very much transformed by um, technological evolutions, which also kind of, you know, touch on artistic ones right. as well. Right. Um, I mean, but, as you as you're as you're talking, a part of this set fell down. <laughs> that wire fell down, <laughs> and it reminded me that like so much of reality is produced within sets like this, yeah. and we never we never see what's behind the set. We don't see what's we don't see the lights. We don't see the cameras and the boom and the and the wires dangling, and. There's sort of, I mean, this is gonna sound funny, but there's a lack of transparency in most of the media and culture that we consume. Um, yeah. Orlando, how, how are you, 
like in your practice as a as a as a tap dancer mm. and as a musician how how are you dealing with these questions of the canon history and how things are written and how do you react against it in your in your practice mm. well i was just working on something with my uh, my friend Tatiana, I'll, I'll shout her out because she was um, she she was putting this thought in my head. Is that I've had the tendency at different points to be like to try and define what I'm doing to be like this is a different this leads to a different thing than you know the mechanisms of Western whiteness or this is like a decolonized like and what she was pointing out is like when you do that you're still kind of putting you're still kind of putting the the colonialism on the page or in the space, you're still kind of putting the, the whiteness there. And it's like, so that, that's a kind of ongoing search, I would say, um, to find modes of being that don't need to feel, not even necessarily reactive, but don't still need to in some way be anchored to these um, oppressive uh, schemes, you know, these constructions of the real that have left out that have not been transparent right and have invisibilized um have invisibilized the labor of black and brown people the, the presence the um the expressions um and i think when it comes to so so it's something so so that's one thought you know and then something that i've been kind of sitting with which is i, I haven't tied it all together yet is like so we've been in this pandemic right um and there's like a the desire to get back to some kind of normalcy has been very strong, like basically imposed, you know. Yeah, but has a normal, has a normalcy ever really existed? I think normalcy does exist as a kind of dominant, you know, it's like you wake up, like most, most people in the country say, well, I, I, I'm not gonna say most people, but I'm gonna say there's a dominant experience that people, like a, a script for, for what the normal is, for what the real is, right? And it has to do with part participating in the U.S. capitalist system. It has to do with participating in um, yeah. you traditional know. forms of success. Right, right. So, so I, I, see, I see that. So I, I mean a kind of normalcy that's like that, you know. And we saw that break for a while. And for a lot of people, it really it was always broken, right? We see, but in a, maybe, in a, maybe in a more massive way, that broke open for a few months. Um, there were maybe more people in the U.S. questioning what has, had been defined as normal and real in the U.S. Um, and then there's this kind of like pull back to, you know, people like the, the, the imposition of like people going back to work, people going back to school, people, you know, these things that, and, and what I am trying to sit with is like, how do, um, we have like hundreds, of, we have hundreds of thousands of, of like basically unmourned deaths right now we like we have we have a, a, a like a, 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 a fissure you know and and I think like to kind of just try and get it back to you know like some idea of, of, of functioning is is not is not where it's at and I think to kind of like create a reel that can embrace the break you know that can embrace absence um, that can cradle absence you know and and I, I so I think for me Still figuring out how that, 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 like how you embody that, but I think we feel those absences, we feel the, the contours of that, you know, and, and, um, and to let that, you know, to, to let the wires dangle, to let the, um, to let the, 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 the ground, you know, be, uh, exposed. be exposed, I think is, is, is yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's the real I'm kind of thinking on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and I, I want to try to connect back to this first question. Um, or this quote about listening that like perhaps and which also connects to sitting at home watching the three of you perform connecting on, st on a stage through musical performance and sound like what is, what is that action doing? It's an action of paying attention and I mean, I, I, I would like to know, I would like to know how do you see music listening 
and performance um, be an action towards remaking the real that represents your individual identities and values. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll talk. Um, yeah, I mean, listening, I think listening, under, you know, it, it, it um, uncovers the truth, mm. you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It's, That's so good. It's kind of as simple and as complicated as that. Mm. You know, if you listen, you'll get to the truth. You'll get to the, you know... Leland, what is truth? I, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it could be a journey for every individual. Kweku is laughing under his mask. Yeah. I can't see. <laughs> it could be a... Um, I'm gonna take a sip of wine if people don't mind, but. I think if you're gonna to start to unpack what truth is, then you're gonna need I'm gonna much need more a, than I'm a sip. Need a, I'm gonna need a, <laughs> a gulp. Um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, it, it, it's quite a journey. It, it's every, everybody has their own journey with it, respective journey as they should, but if we're talking about even like just things in terms of this country, like identity and, and race relations, I mean, there's, you know, some of the stuff that's happening right now in the climate of our culture is not new, you know? And it's, it's interesting to see, you know, like history repeat itself in the worst ways. And I can't help but wonder and say, well, at some point there was, communication was cut off. People weren't listening, you know? The, nobody was listening to each other. The people at the top definitely just cut off, you know, other people because they had the power to do so. And it's not a fact of not hearing them, you just don't want to accept the truth, reality. You know, truth isn't like always gonna be this, you know, light in this thing that we all wanna um, bask in and it's not gonna be all beautiful and pretty. It's the truth is truth. At the end of the day, whether it's ugly or, or pretty, it's, it's something that needs to be dealt with, I think, in order, to, in order for humanity to progress in one way or another, you know, and I, for me, listening comes in, combines all that. So me as a musician, when I listen, um, going back to our previous conversation, when me and Orlando are playing, you know, what I'm listening to is, yeah, I'm trying to pay attention and, you know, grab certain things and make sure I'm in, make sure I'm vibing off of him well. I'm not, you know, it's like a conversation, right? You know, we're talking about this and you just ask me a question, I won't be like, well, you know, I really hated that steak I had yesterday. You know what I mean? It just, I want to make sure I, I'm coming where he's coming from, but at the same time, I am trying to connect and feel, you know, what is it that's happening right now? Where's the truth in this performance? What's the point? What's the purpose? Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if I jumped all around, but I think listening for me is a big part of, of, of that whole thing. You know, what I see like truth, yeah getting to that, that, that point of, uh, you know, whether it makes sense or not, something that is leading in the right direction. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask who yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you.